Good afternoon. The first item of business today is portfolio questions. In order to get as many people in as possible, I prefer short and succinct questions and answers to match. Said more in hope than expectation. I call Richard Leonard, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met the rail unions. Minister. Uh, in addition to regular engagement with the STUC, yeah. further meetings have been held to discuss specific issues with individual uh, unions. Most recently, I met uh, Manuel Cortez, the General Secretary of the TSSA, on the 25th of October. Uh, as part of my regular engagement with the STUC, I will be meeting uh, ASLEF, RMT and TSSA tomorrow, where I imagine a number of issues will be discussed. Yes, Mr. Thank Mr. you, Minister. Um, the three uh, major railway trade unions all oppose the Scottish Government's proposal to wind up British Transport Police's operations in Scotland and absorb the service into Police Scotland. They cite the need for a distinctive police service for the railway. The Deputy Chief Constable of the British Transport Police told this Parliament's own Justice Committee just last week that dual control of the Transport Police's function would lead to even more train delays and railway crimes being downgraded. My constituent Lucy Milton, an employee of the British Transport Police who lives in Airdrie, wrote to me and said, and I quote, there isn't a thought for those of us lying awake at night wondering how we will support families, or indeed how the service we have worked so very hard to provide will be delivered once this is over. They don't care what happens to us. How do you answer Lucy Milton, the Deputy Chief Constable, as left the RMT and the TSSA and the other transport experts, why don't you drop the bill? Now, Mr Leonard, you've settled for us in a bad, bad method because that was not a short second question. I hope you won't repeat that, Minister. I'll keep my, my, my answer brief. I'm going to be engaging with unions tomorrow, as I said, and I'll be keen to hear some of their concerns and see if I can give them the necessary reassurance. What I would say to your constituents, uh, and those uh, who oppose it. A couple of things. First of all, we're giving very assured, uh, a lot of assurances, protecting numbers of staff, protecting terms and conditions for BTP officers, but most importantly, ensuring railway expertise is maintained on the railways. I recognise that British Transport Police officers join British Transport to be on our railways, not to be out in the beat, out in the streets. So we'll protect that uh, railway expertise. And the last thing I would say is why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, we were elected on that manifesto of BTP integration. I remind uh, the member, of course, we got more votes combined than that party and, of course, the main opposition. So that's the rationale of why we're doing what we're doing. But I'll consult with the unions. I'll consult with the British Transport Police. And, of course, I will consult with anybody else who has any uh, concerns over the British Transport Police integration. But police numbers will be protected. Terms and conditions will be protected. I thought that was something he would welcome. Oh, dear. All hope has gone. I call John Scott, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Cabinet Secretary if when he last met the rail unions, if he discussed with them the need for repair and better, for, to, for repair and to better maintain the fabric of the rail station at Prestwick Airport. Thank you. It wasn't raised in the last discussion that I had with rail unions. I'm more than happy to discuss it with the member, take it away, uh, and see if I can bring them some of those assurances uh, and take the issue up with Network Rail. Uh, call second question, Mark Ruskell, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it provides to third sector organisations that seek to build a case for the reopening of rail lines and stations. Minister. The Government provides advice to Transport Scotland if requested, uh, third sector organisations uh, and others on the application of its transport appraisal uh, and business case guidance. This guidance is published on Transport Scotland's website. Mr. Ruskell. Thank you. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? Um, he may not be aware that Newbra Station Group recently unsuccessfully attempted to apply for funds in the National Lottery to develop a stag report after Fife Council had exhausted funds supporting the stag process for the critically important Levermouth Rail Route. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the planning of our 21st century rail network should not be, de should not be dependent on a lottery game? And will he commit to providing enough funds to examine the cases of all emerging rail projects? while also reviewing the stag process to make it more streamlined, transparent and cost effective. Minister. I'm more than happy to uh, discuss this in more detail with the member. I met, of course, the Leave and Mouth Rail campaign, had a very good discussion with them. I think the proposal uh, has some merits. There's still some questions that need to be answered. Now, Fife Council 
uh, are working on, on, on that. Uh, they didn't raise the issue of, of uh, funding uh, for the uh, stag appraisal being an issue. Uh, but I do agree with them that there is merit in looking at stag appraisal to see if it can be made uh, less cumbersome. I'm more than happy uh, to do that and take that feedback. But I'm waiting for the council feedback uh, on the leave and mouth uh, rail uh, option. And if there's a fully uh, costed and robust business case, uh, then of course all rail uh, projects will be considered uh, with an open mind. Rachel Hamilton. Success has been demonstrated by the number of passengers travelling on the Waverley Line from the Scottish borders and illustrates the positive impact that opening, opening lines and stations have on rural communities. The Minister is aware of the ongoing campaign to reopen East Linton and Reston stations. Can the Scottish Government give an indication of when these much-needed stations will be reinstated? Minister. Uh, well, I, when I last uh, met all those and the stakeholders involved in this conversation, I, of course, mentioned the fact that the Scottish Government had increased its contribution to 50% of the construction uh, of those stations. I received a, a letter from the Council saying that uh, they wish to enter into further discussions. I will be writing back to them in the next few days, and I'll make sure that the member is copied into that. But I think there is a way forward. Uh, we are committed. I'm sure the councils, of course, uh, are committed, as are the elected uh, members, to see uh, the reopening of East Linton uh, and Reston stations. Third question, Willie Coffey, please. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will publish a detailed timetable for the installation of superfast broadband that will indicate when the service will be available in each area of Scotland. I'm the Secretary. The planned employment information, including anticipated timescales for the Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme, is made available on the Digital Scotland postcode checker. The DSSB programme will extend fibre broadband access to at least 95% of premises by the end of 2017, and we are committed to extend superfast coverage to 100% of premises across Scotland by 2021. The timetable for delivery will be dependent on the outcome of new procurements, which will begin next year. Mr Coffey. For that answer, as much information, I think, and as soon as possible is the best option for communities and families so that they can get best value for money about the data services they plan to buy themselves. Can I also ask in terms of the broadband contracts that the Scottish Government is delivering with BT, how are we ensuring that we are also getting value for money? Well, I think the member makes a, a very valid point. Obviously, communities throughout Scotland are all keen to know when they may get access to superfast broadband. It's absolutely understandable and we are absolutely not complacent about it. There are five stages in development of uh, in upgrading a green roadside cabinet, namely design, the survey, the build phase, the connection and activation. And obviously, I think all members will understand that at any of these stages, at any one, there can be issues identified that will change the anticipated uh, delivery date. Um, so that, that should be borne in mind in relation to timescales. The member also asks about value for money. Uh, and I can assure him that this is a key consideration. And each quarter, the Digital Superfast Broadband Programme assures milestones delivered by BT against contractual targets. And, Presiding Officer, this assurance feeds into the level of payment that BT receives quarterly. So if BT doesn't deliver, they don't get paid. Thank you. Microphone from Mr. Rumbles, please. That there is a difference between making the service available in each area and connecting every household in that area as, as, your, as the government's com committed to do. Does he understand the frustration that many people feel when superfast broadband lines go past their homes 18 months ago, two years ago, announcements are made that it's in their area now and they still have no idea when they might get connected? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think if uh, Mr Rumbles had listened to my first answer, I, I think I did indicate that information is available on the Digital Scotland Postcode Checker. Um, sorry, Mr Rumbles is, is uh, interrupting from a sedentary position. But I, but I do absolutely agree that, you know, as I said already, I am not complacent about this. I fully understand that these are perfectly legitimate concerns expressed by a great many people. But I am pleased that bodies such... As, the, uh, as Ofcom have recognised and praised the progress that we are making in Scotland. And indeed, Ofcom, who are the regulator, said that the progress uh, in broadband is actually better than south of the border. I appreciate that recognition from the regulator themselves. But we are not complacent and we are aware of these concerns. 
Kenneth Gibson, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can the Cabinet Secretary please advise the Chamber as to what is being done to encourage greater take-up of superfast broadband in areas where it has been delivered in order to allow more resources to be channelled into communities which currently cannot access superfast broadband? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I think, I think a, a great many people are pretty keen themselves to access broadband where they've, obviously they can. I, I think it's a reasonable point the member makes. I'll reflect on that to see if there's more uh, that we can do. And I'm very pleased that he shares our uh, absolute concern and our commitment to ensure that there is the universal coverage by 2021. Uh, and therefore, I will write back to the member to see if there are any ways that we can encourage take up. I think that's primarily a matter for each individual person, whether or not to take up services if he, she or they so wish. Thank you. Question for Daniel Johnson, please. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what actions it is taking to extend access to high-speed fibre uh, broadband across the country. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme will extend fibre broadband access to at least 95% of premises in Scotland by the end of 2017. As outlined in the programme for government, this government has put digital connectivity at the heart of its agenda and is committed to delivering 100% superfast broadband access by the end of this parliament. Mr Johnson. Thank you for that response. And clearly you can measure the importance of broadband by the number of questions tabled about it. Uh, um, given the enduring complexities of deploying fibre broadband cabinets, um, and, and that does currently does not allow Digital Scotland to give any specific detail regarding rollout times, and that many of my own constituents here in the very heart of Edinburgh still do not have access to fibre optic broadband, what is being done to ensure that the March 2018 deadline for rollout will be met? Cabinet Secretary. Well, there's really two, two answers to the question. First of all, we are delivering in two contracts throughout Scotland an investment uh, by the Scottish Government, with support from the UK Government and others, of £400 million. So that's the first thing. And that programme has been praised, as I mentioned, by Ofcom. It's been uh, acknowledged as being effective by Audit Scotland. And also, it has actually been acknowledged as effective by the UK Government. So that's the first thing. And secondly, as I've already said, presiding officer, in the answer to the first question, we shall be rolling out uh, access by procurement process, which shall be entered into next year. And it's important we don't rush this, because progress was sought to be rushed by the UK government in respect of their so-called mobile infrastructure plan. The result was, instead of 78 masts being erected, only three were. And the reason for that was that the preparatory work ascertaining the existing level of cover was not done. In other words, you cannot proceed with the rollout of the, of the contract for the remainder until you're absolutely sure what the specification is about those who already have it. So that preparatory work, sorry for the length, presiding officer, but it's important I answer his question fully. That preparatory work is essential, but we are adhering to our timetables, and I'm very pleased that our progress is being recognised by the regulator, by Audit Scotland, and by the UK government. Well, let's hope answers get shorter and questions. Edward Mountain, please. A short question. Although fibre optic broadband is important in rolling out high speed broadband across Scotland, there are some areas where it will not be appropriate or able to reach. I therefore would like to ask the Scottish Government what methods, aside from fibre optic broadband, which will be cost neutral to the end user, he is considering in these hard to reach areas, many of which is in his constituency and my region. Cabinet Secretary. Yes, I, I, I think I've, I has indicated, that, as I have indicated to the Chamber before, the process of tendering next year acknowledges that uh, one size does not necessarily fit all and will therefore need to be flexible enough to, in, to uh, enable uh, a variety of techniques to be adopted. So I think it's a perfectly reasonable point the Member makes, but it's one that we're already pursuing. Uh, thank you. Question five, Peter Chapman. Thank you, Deputy. Deputy Oh, sorry. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Uh, let me declare an interest as a farmer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it has taken to address the reported concerns of farmers and industry representatives regarding new rules on linked holdings. Cap and an effective disease control, disease eradication and the protection of public health. The system has been developed collaboratively by a joint Scottish Government and Industry Working Group 
to ensure that whilst animal and public health are protected, the requirements are feasible for businesses, meet EU legislative requirements and do not impede trade. Mr Chapman. I am grateful to the Minister for that answer. He will be aware from his meetings with stakeholders and industry leaders that this change has caused a great deal of concern amongst the farming community. Can the Minister explain why he is changing a perfectly good system when the new system is creating further anxiety and another hoop to jump through at an already difficult time for farmers? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, the original question refers to reported concerns, but were unspecified, and they remain unspecified. What I can tell the member is this, that uh, the working group included the National Farmers Union of Scotland. They developed these proposals along with us. So I don't think that uh, they, it can be said that they come as a surprise. The direct answer to his question is twofold. First of all, that the current system risks non-compliance with the EU rules uh, and a fine of up to £3 million. That seems like a sensible matter to avoid if we can, and any prudent government must do that. Second, and most important, uh, presiding officers, disease control. It is absolutely essential that we have a system of recording cattle movements and keeping records that protects against disease. Some of us here can recall what happened when Scotland is beset by disease, and Mr Chapman himself, as a farmer, will be well aware of it. I will write to Mr Chapman with the details. But uh, it's very important in principle for all members to know that the proposals are driven by the need to protect Scotland against disease of serious outbreaks such as foot and mouth. It is absolutely necessary for that. Everybody in the working group acknowledged that, including the NFUS, and that is why it is going ahead. John McAlpine, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, can the Cab Se Cabinet Secretary tell us what progress has been made in implementing the 2016 CAP Basic Payments Loan Scheme? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I'm very pleased to uh, tell John McAlpine that the first payments under the National Basic Payment Support Scheme were paid to almost 12,000 farmers on Friday, last Friday, totalling just over £246 million. This funding obviously will give our rural communities the security and certainty they need to plan for the year ahead whilst driving forward the rural economy. I'm very grateful for all of the officials who successfully administered that payment to just under 12,000 farmers and £246 million. And finally, we would encourage the 5,000 farmers who received presiding officer a loan offer but haven't yet replied to decide if they wish to apply and if so, to return the application slip as soon as possible. Thank you. Question six, Gordon MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government how many homes have exchange-only lines and no access to superfast broadband. Secretary. The Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme has connected over 200,000 homes and businesses on exchange-only lines to the fibre network. By the end of the DSSB contracts, we expect around 320,000 exchange-only lines will be connected. We will undertake an open market review later this year to determine how many premises will not have super-fast broadband access delivered commercially or through the DSSB programme. This will allow us to determine an intervention area for our new investment programme, which will help deliver our 100% super-fast broadband commitment. Gordon MacDonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Constituents from Fairmile Head to Balerno and Ratho who have exchange only lines are concerned that they only have access to basic broadband with very low download speeds, in some cases as low as 0.8 bits per second. What steps are being taken to address this issue in semi rural areas and when will they get access to super fast broadband? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, well I, I can advise the member that uh, his independence in the Fair Miley Head exchanges that cover Balerno and Fair Miley Head um, have been enabled for fibre, but not all homes and businesses have been connected yet. Constituents can check their details on the Digital Scotland website or contact the DSSB team with any specific concerns they have. Uh, I'm aware of Mr McDonald's strong interest in this matter and I will write to him with further details about this. Can I apologise to the four members I was unable to call? I am trying, along with other presiding officers, to get short questions, short answers, to allow the people at the tail end to get in. We'll get there one day with your help. I have to move on to the next set of portfolio questions. 
Question one, Ian Gray, please. To ask the Scottish Government what support it will offer the new National Marine Centre being developed at North Berwick. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government wrote in support for the National Marine Centre in North Berwick as part of its successful application to the Heritage Lottery Fund. Marine Scotland officials sit on the project's Marine Advisory Group, providing advice and support as it develops its subsequent application to the Heritage Lottery Fund, as well as other funding opportunities. Mr Gray. Uh, the National Marine Centre is a development of the Scottish Seabird Centre, which has uh, a, a substantial track record of success, some 270,000 visitors per year, bringing people from all over Scotland and indeed the world to North Berwick. The Marine Centre project has the potential to expand that educational and tourism success into all aspects of the marine and coastal environment. Uh, as the Cabinet Secretary indicated, a major fundraising programme is underway but further government support will be crucial to secure match funding uh, to the lottery funds in order to allow the project to proceed. Will the Cabinet Secretary commit to seeking such an investment? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I've indicated uh, uh, the, uh, some of the support so far. Um, I understand that uh, a 3.5 million bid is being made to the Heritage Lottery Fund. Uh, I would agree uh, with the member that this is an extraordinary uh, uh, potential development and uh, uh, offers a very great deal. Um, there is a, a funding gap, I think, of £2 million, uh, pounds, um, and uh, there will be potential funding applications required. One of those is to the Coastal Communities Fund, um, and uh, round four awards will be announced in March 2017. Uh, although the Scottish Government does commit funding to the Coastal Communities Fund, um, uh, ministers are not actively involved in the decision making for that, uh, as the member uh, no doubt uh, understands. Uh, although the Coastal Communities Fund funding officer is meeting with the project team to discuss details of the application on 18 November. Question to Alexander Burnett, please. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how much carbon dioxide was released as a result of INEOS importing shale gas from the United States. Cabinet Secretary. Whilst the Scottish Government and SEPA hold a range of site-specific emissions data, the data on feedstock delivery and specific processes which take place within an individual site is not available. The Scottish Government does not therefore hold information on the CO2 emissions from imported ethane gas for particular sites. Emissions from the production of shale gas will be captured in the inventory of the country of origin. Mr Burnett. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. Uh, as you will be aware, climate change has no borders. Is she therefore happy to not only be costing our economy jobs, but also managing to cause a greater environmental, imp environmental impact at the same time? Well, the, the, the Scottish Government continues to value the contribution Grange Bath makes to the Scottish economy. We're supportive of the investment and efforts to ensure a sustainable future for the petrochemical and uh, refinery business. Uh, and obviously decisions about uh, sourcing uh, supply for that are a matter for the company. But we need to be extraordinarily careful, as we've seen uh, 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 in discussions over the last few weeks about adopting any kind of gung-ho or rushed approach to this industry. Um, it is the job of government to base decisions on evidence. I think the, uh, the, minister, uh, the minister's statement uh, made it very clear how we're going to proceed on the basis of the research that is available uh, to us, and we will come to a considered judgment on unconventional oil and gas by the end of 2017. Mark Ruskell, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the report on unconventional gas decommissioning launched yesterday found big gaps in the regulations, with the full costs of restoration unlikely to be known until the end of any project. Given the failure of the coal industry to successfully clean up the toxic legacy it left behind in areas such as West Fife, will the Cabinet Secretary commit to including full liability for environmental clean-up costs in the Government's consideration of the economics of unconventional gas? Uh, well, these are issues which uh, uh, clearly we will uh, be looking at. I understand why uh, there is a huge uh, amount of particular concern around this. I can assure the Chamber that the Scottish Government is treating this issue with the seriousness it deserves. Um, there were some indications uh, uh, from the experts' conclusions um, that there was low risk of post-decommissioning well failure, but we're looking very carefully at all of that and we will be taking that into consideration as we move forward. Third question, Rachel Hamilton, please. 
to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to tackle the threat to woodland from invasive rhododendron. Cabinet Secretary. Well, responsibility for the removal of invasive non-native species such as rhododendron lies with landowners uh, rather than government. The Scottish Government makes funding available to private woodland owners for rhododendron control projects under the Scottish Rural Development Programme Forestry Grant Scheme. To date, over £340,000 of FGS funding has been committed. Action on the National Forest Estate has already cleared an area of 5,131 hectares since 2011 on designated sites. Rachel Hamilton. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Woodland Trust and National Trust for Scotland say our trees and woods are under real pressure from rhododendron. Both are calling on the Scottish Government to focus the right resources and give the correct priority to the eradication of this invasive species. Scotland has by far the largest, the largest population of rhododendron at 53,000 hectares with the largest concentration in the West. Will the Scottish Government address this ecological issue before the situation gets beyond control? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I've already indicated in my uh, initial answer that uh, landowners uh, have also got to be involved in this. Um, we are taking the threat to woodland from invasive uh, rhododendron very seriously. We're currently in the process of finalising a national approach uh, and the uh, final draft of that is likely to be published in March 2017. No doubt the member will be uh, watching out uh, for that with uh, great interest. Uh, as I indicated, there is funding for private woodland owners. Uh, if there are individual woodland owners that the member is in touch with who haven't actually applied for that funding, I would urge her to suggest that they do so. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary further to that question, what support is given for partnership working with NGOs and volunteers and public bodies uh, in relation to um, these, these types of uh, challenging invasive species? Uh, there's such a scourge on our countryside, and I visited Scottish Wildlife Trust Nethan Gorge uh, Reserve recently, and there's a, 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 the start of Japanese knotweed there. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a very serious problem. Cabinet Secretary. The, the member is absolutely correct. Uh, although rhododendron is probably the most invasive species uh, that we have to deal with, it is not by any stretch of the imagination the only one uh, with uh, Japanese knotweed, giant hogweed or Himalayan balsam uh, also uh, being a particular problem. Um, the same issue uh, arises in respect of those that is landowners who themselves who have the primary responsibility. I mean, one of the reasons I indicated uh, on the National Forest Estate the work that has been done is because, of course, Scottish Government is also a landowner, as are NGOs, uh, um, and, uh, uh, and uh, other, there are other community landowners. Landownership brings with it uh, huge responsibilities. This is one of them. Um, the funding that is available um, doesn't uh, uh, mandate any particular uh, 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 kind of working. So the, uh, we encourage uh, um, landscape scale partnership work specifically within designated sites because in reality uh, that kind of partnership working is what will help us eradicate this pest. Question for Mark Griffin please. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what lessons can we learn from the Central Scotland Green Network in relation to biodiversity? I'm de sec delighted that this Government is supporting Europe's largest green space project, the Central Scotland Green Network. Its work is demonstrating that nature can thrive in built up areas and bring a range of benefits for communities across the Central Belt. Its work includes everything from landscape scale initiatives such as Seven Lochs Wetland Park large-scale green space improvements and small-scale initiatives like window boxes. Its activity is also showing how biodiversity can revitalise neighbourhoods. For example, vacant and derelict land provides opportunities to green our urban landscapes, both temporarily and permanently. Mark Griffin. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Scottish Government launched Scotland's Biodiversity, a route map to 2020 last summer. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what progress has been made towards achieving the six big steps for nature? Well, we, can, we continue to make progress uh, in respect of biodiversity, but uh, um, uh, as I have uh, indicated in the meetings that I've had even just over this week, including with CSGN uh, yesterday, um, we know that there is still a very great deal more to be done. Uh, and one of the things, uh, and this is where the linkages right across all parts of this portfolio, um, one of the things that help 
uh, in terms of biodiversity is to look at the kind of landscape partnership that we were talking about in the previous question. Uh, and that uh, uh, um, means that even dealing with things like uh, rhododendron have an impact, a beneficial impact on, uh, on biodiversity. So the actions that we take uh, right across government are important uh, and we continue to make uh, the progress uh, that we are making while accepting that there is still a great deal more to do. Maurice Golden, please. The Central Scotland Green Network can be seen as a building block towards a national uh, ecological network. The Scottish Government's Biodiversity 2020 strategy states that developing a national ecological network has proved challenging because there isn't a consensus on what that is. In fact, the Chief Executive of SNH said earlier this week, what is it? No one knows. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that there is a need to define what the na National Ecological Network is to better target resources as well as embed across different areas, including land use strategy, marine policy, the biodiversity strategy and the national planning framework? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, I have to say that I try not to get drawn into extended arguments about specific definitions, having been involved in previous years when I was in some of this portfolio previously, uh, where people were even questioning uh, the use of the word biodiversity itself, and uh, the member has probably himself uh, been in that kind of conversation. Um, we can spend a lot of time uh, talking about definitions. Uh, what I would like to do, however, is to be able to commend the examples such as the CSGN, who are in fact kind of doing it anyway, uh, right across what might be seen as the most difficult part of Scotland in order to make these arguments. But they are making them, they are winning. And some of the things that the CSGN are involved in are quite extraordinary. Uh, and in, in a sense, it doesn't actually matter how you make the definition sound, as long as you're doing it on the ground. Thank you. Question five, Brian Whittle, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to ensure that Scottish water maintains the highest standards of water quality. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government recognises the importance of achieving high standards of drinking water quality. In the period 2015 to 21, Scottish water has been directed to make improvements to Scotland's drinking water at a cost of in excess of £500 million. Compliance with drinking water standards is assessed by the Drinking Water Quality Regulator for Scotland. In her 2015 annual report, she reported that at 99.92%, Scottish water had delivered record levels of compliance with legislative standards. Mr Whipple. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I wonder if she's aware that statistics recently published on Scottish environment show that the number of rivers and lochs that are categorised as having poor water quality has increased by 17% since 2011. Will the Scottish Government take more affirmative action to mitigate this problem and help to prevent the providential knock-on impact on riparian wildlife? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Scottish Water are uh, um, uh, constantly uh, keeping a watching eye on water quality. Um, uh, I think that's extremely important, whether we're talking about lochs or bathing waters or uh, drinking water um, uh, or, or whatever. Um, uh, there are a number of uh, treatments underway which will uh, help in that regard. If the member has any specific uh, concerns that he wishes to raise, uh, then I would invite him to do so either through me or directly to Scottish Water itself. Thank you, David. Stuart, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. The Cabinet Secretary will be well aware that SEPA and SNH work very closely with the whisky industry to ensure the highest possible quality of water for both climate change and Scottish export market purposes. Would the Cabinet Secretary join with me in praising the collaborative work being carried out with Diageo and the environmental agencies which created the new state-of-the-art closed-loop distillery condenser at the new Rosile facility in Speyside? Cabinet Secretary. It, it certainly sounds like something that I would very much want to uh, commend, but I do thank the member for raising this issue because I'm also aware from having fairly recently been at the launch of it that the Scottish whisky industry is now moving quite strongly uh, in terms of uh, uh, environmental uh, concerns and have in fact launched an environmental strategy uh, of their own. Uh, I think that's to be very welcome because after all, Scotch whisky is sold onto the international market 
uh, on an image of, uh, uh, of clean water, of you know, uh, a beautiful environment. Yeah. Um, and it's very, very important uh, when industries, when products are, done, are, are sold in that way from Scotland, uh, that the industries involved in the production of those products realise that they too have a responsibility for that environment. Thank you. Question six, Mary Evans. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what progress has been made in implementing its circular economy strategy. Cabinet Secretary. Since making things last, our circular economy strategy was launched in February. Uh, I have uh, opened the Circular Economy Investment Fund for bids from collaborative reuse and repair projects by SMEs and social enterprises. Uh, I've awarded over £2 million to East Ayrshire Council to implement the Household Recycling Charter with further support available to councils to deliver a consistent approach to recycling in Scotland and welcome that 20 local authorities have now signed up uh, to the Charter. Um, additional activity is underway by public bodies, partner organisations and indeed by other cabinet secretaries and ministers as this is a cross-cutting government approach which can only succeed if everyone plays their part. Thank you, Mary Evans, please. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response, and she actually answered the first part of my supplementary there, which was going to be about the Household Recycling Charter. Uh, but I would like to ask the Scottish Government what further work the Government will be undertaking with local authorities, given that they will be responsible for implementing many of the actions that are in the strategy. Well, I apologise to the Member for gazumping her in terms of her question. As I indicated, 20 of Scotland's 32 councils have signed up to the Household Recycling Charter. It's been so successful thus far, I think, due to the close collaboration between the Scottish Government and COSLA that brought it about in the first place. That cooperation will continue as we start to implement the Charter on the ground and as we take forward other elements of making things last, including the commitment to review the rural exemption for food waste collections. I think it's fair to say that a number of the councils who've signed up are in the early stages of their transition uh, planning for this, uh, but the idea is to ensure that as much as possible we have a consistency uh, across council boundaries uh, of uh, uh, the way recycling is done, and we think that will offer much more opportunity than is currently done so uh, by the potential that is open with waste and recycling. Thank you. Question 7. John Finney, please. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has had with the Ministry of Defence in the last year regarding the environment. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government and Ministry of Defence officials have had a number of meetings in the last year to discuss a range of environmental issues, including protected areas, radioactive substances and MOD plans for the marine environment. Mr Finney. Uh, uh, thank you. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that and indeed for a reply last week to the question asked requesting the Scottish Government look at a, a, an assessment of the impact of the unmanned warrior um, MOD exercise. In reply to that, Cabinet Secretary, you said that the competent authority MOD has responsibility for undertaking any appropriate environmental assessments under relevant EU directives or EU legislation. Can you advise whether these assessments have been shared with the Scottish Government? And if not, will you request and publish them, please? Cabinet Secretary. Well, um, yes, the, the, the member is correct. The Ministry of uh, Defence are the competent authority responsible for all environmental matters related to defence under the relevant EU and UK uh, legislation. Um, we do discuss a number of things uh, with them. In, uh, there has been a, a fairly recent meeting with uh, MOD officials to discuss the proposed Inner Hebrides and Minches Special Area of Conservation um, uh, for Harbour Porpoise. Um, Marine Scotland uh, also uh, maintains a regular relationship uh, with, uh, 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 with uh, uh, the MOD. Uh, we obviously want to assist them where possible to, to deliver on their environmental uh, obligations. Um, uh, I will uh, need to double check for the member whether or not, since we don't in a sense own them, whether or not we are able to publish uh, the environmental assessments and I will get back to the member when I have established that. Our colleague, just squeeze Tom Arthur and Mr Arthur, please. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reduce carbon emissions. Cabinet Secretary. Scotland is a world leader in tackling climate change with ambitious statutory targets and strong progress to date. Our policies and measures include expanding renewable energy production, improvements in energy and resource efficiency, transition of transport to a lower carbon basis, expansion of renewable heat and sustainable land use. Uh, Scottish emissions in 2014 were down by 45.8% from baseline levels 
meaning we have exceeded the level of our world-leading statutory 2020 target to reduce emissions by 42 per cent from baseline levels six years early. Mr Arthur, please supplement you, please. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. In the spirit of terse questions, can I ask what further measures and action can be taken by the government to reduce tar um, carbon emissions from transport? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as, as the member might expect, I uh, uh, might uh, suggest to him that one of the things he could do is uh, ask the Minister for Transport directly. Uh, I can advise the member that with the drawing up of the climate change plan, which will be presented, the draft climate change plan, which will be presented to uh, Parliament uh, um, in January, there will be a number of transport-related measures uh, in that plan, and I no doubt he will be looking forward to that uh, with some interest. Uh, thank you. Before we move on to the next item of business, can I apologise to the two members who weren't taken, but we're improving. And we'll now move on to the next item of business. I'll give members a moment to exchange front benches.